Genocide is intentional action to destroy a people usually defined as an ethnic, national, racial, or religious group in whole or in part. The hybrid word, genocide, is a combination of the Greek word genos, race, people, and the Latin suffix side, act of killing. The United Nations Genocide Convention, which was established in 1948, defines genocide as acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial or religious group." The term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin in his 1944 book Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. It has been applied to the Holocaust, and many other mass killings including the genocide of indigenous peoples in the Americas, the Armenian Genocide, the Greek Genocide, the Assyrian Genocide, the Serbian Genocide, the Holodomor, the Indonesian Genocide, the Guatemalan Genocide, the 1971 Bangladesh Genocide, the Cambodian Genocide, and after 1980 the Bosnian Genocide, the Kurdish Genocide, the Dar Darfur Genocide, and the Rwandan Genocide. The Political Instability Task Force estimated that, between 1956 and 2016, a total of 43 genocides took place, causing the death of about 50 million people. The UNHCR estimated that a further 50 million had been displaced by such episodes of violence up to 2008. <laughs> Origin of the term Before 1944, various terms, including «massacre», «crimes against humanity», and «extermination», were used to describe intentional, systematic killings. In 1941, Winston Churchill, when describing the German invasion of the Soviet Union, spoke of «a crime without a name». In 1944, Raphael Lemkin created the term genocide in his book Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. The book describes the implementation of Nazi policies in occupied Europe, and cites earlier mass killings. The term described the systematic destruction of a nation or people, and the word was quickly adopted by many in the international community. The word genocide is the combination of the Greek prefix geno, genos meaning race or people and kadir the Latin word for to kill. The word genocide was used in indictments at the Nuremberg trials, held from 1945, but solely as a descriptive term, not yet as a formal legal term. According to Lemkin, genocide was a coordinated strategy to destroy a group of people, a process that could be accomplished through total annihilation as well as strategies that eliminate key elements of the group's basic existence, including language, culture, and economic infrastructure. Lemkin defined genocide as follows Generally speaking, genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killings of all members of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups, with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be the disintegration of the political and social institutions, of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups, and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. The preamble to the 1948 Genocide Convention notes that instances of genocide have taken place throughout history. But it was not until Lemkin coined the term and the prosecution of perpetrators of the Holocaust at the Nuremberg Trials that the United Nations defined the crime of genocide under international law in the Genocide Convention. Lemkin's lifelong interest in the mass murder of populations in the 20th century was initially in response to the killing of Armenians in 1915 and later to the mass murders in Nazi controlled Europe. He referred to the Albigensian Crusade as one of the most conclusive cases of genocide in religious history. He dedicated his life to mobilizing the international community, to work together to prevent the occurrence of such events. In a 1949 interview, Lemkin said, I became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians, then after the Armenians, Hitler took action. As a crime. International law 
After the Holocaust, which had been perpetrated by Nazi Germany and its allies prior to and during World War II, Lemkin successfully campaigned for the universal acceptance of international laws defining and forbidding genocides. In 1946, the first session of the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution that affirmed that genocide was a crime under international law and enumerated examples of such events but did not provide a full legal definition of the crime. In 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide which defined the crime of genocide for the first time. Genocide is a denial of the right of existence of entire human groups, as homicide is the denial of the right to live of individual human beings. Such denial of the right of existence shocks the conscience of mankind, results in great losses to humanity in the form of cultural and other contributions represented by these human groups, and is contrary to moral law and the spirit and aims of the United Nations. Many instances of such crimes of genocide have occurred when racial, religious, political and other groups have been destroyed, entirely or in part. The CPPCG was adopted by the UN General Assembly on 9 December 1948 and came into effect on 12 January 1951 Resolution 260 it contains an internationally recognized definition of genocide which has been incorporated into the national criminal legislation of many countries, and was also adopted by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which established the International Criminal Court Article 2 of the Convention defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial or religious group, as such, the first draft of the convention included political killings, but these provisions were removed in a political and diplomatic compromise following objections from some countries, including the USSR, a permanent Security Council member. The USSR argued that the convention's definition should follow the etymology of the term, and may have feared greater international scrutiny of its own mass killings. Other nations feared that including political groups in the definition would invite international intervention in domestic politics. However leading genocide scholar William Shabas states, "...rigorous examination of the travaux fails to confirm a popular impression in the literature that the opposition to inclusion of political genocide was some Soviet machination. The Soviet views were also shared by a number of other states for whom it is difficult to establish any geographic or social common denominator, Lebanon, Sweden, Brazil, Peru, Venezuela, the Philippines, the Dominican Republic, Iran, Egypt, Belgium, and Uruguay. The exclusion of political groups was in fact originally promoted by a non-governmental organization, the World Jewish Congress, and it corresponded to Raphael Lemkin's vision of the nature of the crime of genocide. The convention's purpose and scope was later described by the United Nations Security Council as follows. The convention was manifestly adopted for humanitarian and civilizing purposes. Its objectives are to safeguard the very existence of certain human groups and to affirm and emphasize the most elementary principles of humanity and morality. In view of the rights involved, the legal obligations to refrain from genocide are recognized as erga omnes. When the convention was drafted, it was already envisaged that it would apply not only to then existing forms of genocide, but also to any method that might be evolved in the future with a view to destroying the physical existence of a group. As emphasized in the preamble to the convention, genocide has marred all periods of history, and it is this very tragic recognition that gives the concept its historical evolutionary nature. The convention must be interpreted in good faith, in accordance with the ordinary meaning of its terms, in their context, and in the light of its object and purpose. Moreover, the text of the convention should be interpreted in such a way that a reason and a meaning can be attributed to every word. No word or provision may be disregarded or treated as superfluous, unless this is absolutely necessary to give effect to the terms read as a whole. Genocide is a crime under international law regardless of whether committed in time of peace or in time of war. Art. I. Thus, irrespective of the context in which it occurs, for example, peacetime, internal strife, international armed conflict, or whatever the general overall situation, genocide is a punishable international crime. Topic. Specific provisions Topic. 
Topic: <laughs> Intent to destroy. In 2007, the European Court of Human Rights (ECHR) noted in its judgment on Georgique v. Germany case that, in 1992, the majority of legal scholars took the narrow view that intent to destroy in the CPPCG meant the intended physical biological destruction of the protected group, and that this was still the majority opinion. But the ECHR also noted that a minority took a broader view, and did not consider biological physical destruction to be necessary, as the intent to destroy a national, racial, religious, or ethnic group was enough to qualify as genocide. In the same judgment, the ECHR reviewed the judgments of several international and municipal courts. It noted that the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice had agreed with the narrow interpretation that biological physical destruction was necessary for an act to qualify as genocide. The ECHR also noted that at the time of its judgment, apart from courts in Germany which had taken a broad view, that there had been few cases of genocide under other convention states' municipal laws, and that there are no reported cases in which the courts of these states have defined the type of group destruction the perpetrator must have intended in order to be found guilty of genocide. In the case of Once for R. Wabakombi, the German Supreme Court adhered to its previous judgment, and did not follow the narrow interpretation of the ICTY and the ICJ. In part The phrase, in whole or in part, has been subject to much discussion by scholars of international humanitarian law. The International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia found in Prosecutor v. Radislav Kerstik, Trial Chamber I, Judgment, IT 98-33 ICTY 8 August 2001 that genocide had been committed. In Prosecutor v. Radislav Kerstik, Appeals Chamber, Judgment, IT 98-33 ICTY 7 the 19th of April 2004 paragraphs 8, 9, 10, and 11 addressed the issue of in part and found that the part must be a substantial part of that group. The aim of the Genocide Convention is to prevent the intentional destruction of entire human groups, and the part targeted must be significant enough to have an impact on the group as a whole. The Appeals Chamber goes into details of other cases and the opinions of respected commentators on the Genocide Convention to explain how they came to this conclusion. The judges continue in paragraph 12. The determination of when the targeted part is substantial enough to meet this requirement may involve a number of considerations. The numeric size of the targeted part of the group is the necessary and important starting point, though not in all cases the ending point of the inquiry. The number of individuals targeted should be evaluated not only in absolute terms, but also in relation to the overall size of the entire group. In addition to the numeric size of the targeted portion, its prominence within the group can be a useful consideration. If a specific part of the group is emblematic of the overall group, or is essential to its survival, that may support a finding that the part qualifies as substantial within the meaning of Article 4 of the Tribunal's Statute. In paragraph 13 the judges raise the issue of the perpetrator's access to the victims. The historical examples of genocide also suggest that the area of the perpetrator's activity and control, as well as the possible extent of their reach, should be considered. The intent to destroy formed by a perpetrator of genocide will always be limited by the opportunity presented to him. While this factor alone will not indicate whether the targeted group is substantial, it can, in combination with other factors, inform the analysis. Topic: <laughs> Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide (CPPCG) coming into force. The convention came into force as international law on 12 January 1951 after the minimum 20 countries became parties. At that time however, only two of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council were parties to the treaty, France and the Republic of China. 
The Soviet Union ratified in 1954, the United Kingdom in 1970, the People's Republic of China in 1983 having replaced the Taiwan-based Republic of China on the UNSC in 1971, and the United States in 1988. This long delay in support for the convention by the world's most powerful nations caused the convention to languish for over four decades. Only in the 1990s did the international law on the crime of genocide begin to be enforced. <laughs> UN Security Council on Genocide UN Security Council Resolution 1674, adopted by the United Nations Security Council on 28 April 2006, reaffirms the provisions of paragraphs 138 and 139 of the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document regarding the responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. The resolution committed the Council to action to protect civilians in armed conflict. In 2008, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1820, which noted that, rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute war crimes, crimes against humanity, or a constitutive act with respect to genocide. Municipal <inaudible> law <inaudible> <inaudible> Since the convention came into effect in January 1951 about 80 United Nations member states have passed legislation that incorporates the provisions of CPPCG into their municipal law. Criticisms of the CPPCG and other definitions of genocide William Shabas has suggested that a permanent body is recommended by the Whitaker Report to monitor the implementation of the Genocide Convention, and require states to issue reports on their compliance with the Convention such as were incorporated into the United Nations Optional Protocol to the Convention Against Torture, would make the Convention more effective. Writing in 1998 Kurt Jonasson and Karen Bjornsson stated that the CPPCG was a legal instrument resulting from a diplomatic compromise. As such the wording of the treaty is not intended to be a definition suitable as a research tool, and although it is used for this purpose, as it has an international legal credibility that others lack, other definitions have also been postulated. Jonasson and Bjornsson go on to say that none of these alternative definitions have gained widespread support for various reasons. Jonasson and Bjornsson postulate that the major reason why no single generally accepted genocide definition has emerged is because academics have adjusted their focus to emphasize different periods and have found it expedient to use slightly different definitions to help them interpret events. For example, Frank Chalk and Kurt Jonasson studied the whole of human history, while Leo Kuper and R. J. Rummel in their more recent works concentrated on the 20th century, and Helen Fine, Barbara Harf and Ted Gurr have looked at post-World War II events. Jonasson and Bjornsson are critical of some of these studies, arguing that they are too expansive, and conclude that the academic discipline of genocide studies is too young to have a canon of work on which to build an academic paradigm. The exclusion of social and political groups as targets of genocide in the CPPCG legal definition has been criticized by some historians and sociologists, for example, M. Hassan Cocker in his book The Soviet Invasion and the Afghan Response, 1979 1982, argues that the international national definition of genocide is too restricted, and that it should include political groups or any group so defined by the perpetrator and quotes Chalk and Jonasson. Genocide is a form of one-sided mass killing in which a state or other authority intends to destroy a group, as that group and membership in it are defined by the perpetrator. In turn some states such as Ethiopia, France, and Spain include political groups as legitimate genocide victims in their anti-genocide laws. Barbara Harf and Ted Gurr defined genocide as the promotion and execution of policies by a state or its agents which result in the deaths of a substantial portion of a group when the victimized groups are defined primarily in terms of their communal characteristics, i.e., ethnicity, religion or nationality. Harf and Gurr also differentiate between genocides and politicides by the characteristics by which members of a group are identified by the state. In genocides, the victimized groups are defined primarily in terms of their communal characteristics, i.e., ethnicity, religion or nationality. 
In politicides the victim groups are defined primarily in terms of their hierarchical position or political opposition to the regime and dominant groups. Daniel D. Polsby and Don B. Cates Jr. state that, "...we follow Harf's distinction between genocides and pogroms, which she describes as short-lived outbursts by mobs, which, although often condoned by authorities, rarely persist." If the violence persists for long enough, however, Harf argues, the distinction between condonation and complicity collapses." According to R. J. Rummel, genocide has three different meanings. The ordinary meaning is murder by government of people due to their national, ethnic, racial, or religious group membership. The legal meaning of genocide refers to the International Treaty, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide this also includes non-killings that in the end eliminate the group, such as preventing births or forcibly transferring children out of the group to another group. A generalized meaning of genocide is similar to the ordinary meaning but also includes government killings of political opponents or otherwise intentional murder. It is to avoid confusion regarding what meaning is intended that Rummel created the term democide for the third meaning, highlighting the potential for state and non state actors to commit genocide in the 21st century, for example, in failed states or as non state actors acquire weapons of mass destruction. Adrian Gallagher defined genocide as when a source of collective power, usually a state, intentionally uses its power base to implement a process of destruction in order to destroy a group, as defined by the perpetrator, in whole or in substantial part, dependent upon relative group size. The definition upholds the centrality of intent, the multidimensional understanding of destroy, broadens the definition of group identity beyond that of the 1948 definition yet argues that a substantial part of a group has to be destroyed before it can be classified as genocide. <laughs> <laughs> International prosecution of genocide By ad hoc tribunals All signatories to the CPPCG are required to prevent and punish acts of genocide, both in peace and wartime, though some barriers make this enforcement difficult. In particular, some of the signatories namely, Bahrain, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, the United States, Vietnam, Yemen, and former Yugoslavia signed with the proviso that no claim of genocide could be brought against them at the International Court of Justice without their consent. Despite official protests from other signatories notably Cyprus and Norway on the ethics and legal standing of these reservations, the immunity from prosecution they grant has been invoked from time to time, as when the United States refused to allow a charge of genocide brought against it by former Yugoslavia following the 1999 Kosovo War. It is commonly accepted that, at least since World War II, genocide has been illegal under customary international law as a peremptory norm, as well as under conventional international law. Acts of genocide are generally difficult to establish for prosecution, because a chain of accountability must be established. International criminal courts and tribunals function primarily because the states involved are incapable or unwilling to prosecute crimes of this magnitude themselves. <laughs> Nuremberg Tribunal 1945-1946 The Nazi leaders who were prosecuted shortly after World War II for taking part in the Holocaust, and other mass murders, were charged under existing international laws, such as crimes against humanity, as the crime of genocide was not formally defined until the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide CPPCG. Nevertheless, the recently coined term appeared in the indictment of the Nazi leaders, Count Three, which stated that those charged had conducted deliberate and systematic genocide—namely, the extermination of racial and national groups—against the civilian populations of certain occupied territories in order to destroy particular races and classes of people, and national, racial or religious groups, particularly Jews, Poles, Gypsies and others. International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia 1993 
The term Bosnian genocide is used to refer either to the killings committed by Serb forces in Srebrenica in 1995, or to ethnic cleansing that took place elsewhere during the 1992 1995 Bosnian War. In 2001, the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia judged that the 1995 Srebrenica massacre was an act of genocide. On 26 February 2007, the International Court of Justice ICJ, in the Bosnian Genocide case upheld the ICTY's earlier finding that the massacre in Srebrenica and Zepa constituted genocide, but found that the Serbian government had not participated in a wider genocide on the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina during the war, as the Bosnian government had claimed. On 12 July 2007, European Court of Human Rights when dismissing the appeal by Nikola Jorzik against his conviction for genocide by a German court v. Germany noted that the German court's wider interpretation of genocide has since been rejected by international courts considering similar cases. The ECHR also noted that in the 21st century, "...amongst scholars, the majority have taken the view that ethnic cleansing, in the way in which it was carried out by the Serb forces in Bosnia and Herzegovina in order to expel Muslims and Croats from their homes, did not constitute genocide." However, there are also a considerable number of scholars who have suggested that these acts did amount to genocide, and the ICTY has found in the Momchilo Kreisnik case that the actus royce of genocide was met in Prigidor. With regard to the charge of genocide, the chamber found that in spite of evidence of acts perpetrated in the municipalities which constituted the actus royce of genocide, about 30 people have been indicted for participating in genocide or complicity in genocide during the early 1990s in Bosnia. To date, after several plea bargains and some convictions that were successfully challenged on appeal two men, Vujadin Popovic and Lubisa Bera, have been found guilty of committing genocide, Stravko Tolomir has been found guilty of committing genocide and conspiracy to commit genocide, and two others, Radislav Kerstik and Drago Nikolic, have been found guilty of aiding and abetting genocide. Three others have been found guilty of participating in genocides in Bosnia by German courts, one of whom Nikola Jorzik lost an appeal against his conviction in the European Court of Human Rights. A further eight men, former members of the Bosnian Serb security forces were found guilty of genocide by the State Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina see list of Bosnian genocide prosecutions. Slobodan Milosevic, as the former president of Serbia and of Yugoslavia, was the most senior political figure to stand trial at the ICTY. He died on of March 2006 during his trial where he was accused of genocide or complicity in genocide in territories within Bosnia and Herzegovina, so no verdict was returned. In 1995, the ICTY issued a warrant for the arrest of Bosnian Serbs Radovan Karadžić and Ratko Miladić on several charges including genocide. On 21 July 2008, Karadžić was arrested in Belgrade, and later tried in The Hague accused of genocide among other crimes. On 24 March 2016, Karadžić was found guilty of genocide in Srebrenica, war crimes and crimes against humanity, 10 of the 11 charges in total, and sentenced to 40 years imprisonment. Miladić was arrested on 26 May 2011 in Lazarevo, Serbia, and was tried in The Hague. The verdict, delivered on the 22nd of November 2017 found Miladić guilty of 10 of the 11 charges, including genocide and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Topic: International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, 1994 to present. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda (ICTR) is a court under the auspices of the United Nations for the prosecution of offenses committed in Rwanda during the genocide which occurred there during April 1994, commencing on the 6th of April. The ICTR was created on 8 November 1994 by the Security Council of the United Nations in order to judge those people responsible for the acts of genocide and other serious violations of the international law performed in the territory of Rwanda, or by Rwandan citizens in nearby states, between 1 January and 31 December 1994. So far, the ICTR has finished 19 trials and convicted 27 accused persons. On 14 December 2009 two more men were accused and convicted for their crimes. Another 25 persons are still on trial. 
21 air awaiting trial in detention, two more added on 14 December 2009. Ten are still at large. The first trial, of Jean-Paul Akayasu, began in 1997. In October 1998, Akayasu was sentenced to life imprisonment. Jean Kambanda, interim prime minister, pleaded guilty. Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia 2003 to present. The Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, Ta Mok and other leaders, organized the mass killing of ideologically suspect groups. The total number of victims is estimated at approximately 1.7 million Cambodians between 1975 to 1979, including deaths from slave labor. On the 6th of June 2003, the Cambodian government and the United Nations reached an agreement to set up the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia (ECCC), which would focus exclusively on crimes committed by the most senior Khmer Rouge officials during the period of Khmer Rouge rule of 1975 to 1979. The judges were sworn in early July 2006. The genocide charges related to killings of Cambodia's Vietnamese and Cham minorities, which is estimated to make up tens of thousand killings, and possibly Mareth investigating judges were presented with the names of five possible suspects by the prosecution on the 18th of July 2007. Kong Kekiew was formally charged with war crime and crimes against humanity and detained by the tribunal on the 31st of July 2007. He was indicted on charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity on 12 August 2008. His appeal against his conviction for war crimes and crimes against humanity was rejected on 3 February 2012, and he is serving a sentence of life imprisonment. Nguyen Chi, a former prime minister, who was indicted on charges of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and several other crimes under Cambodian law on 15 September 2010. He was transferred into the custody of the ECCC on 19 September 2007. His trial started on 27 June 2011 and ended on 7 August 2014, with a life sentence imposed for crimes against humanity. Q. Samphan, a former head of state, who was indicted on charges of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and several other crimes under Cambodian law on 15 September 2010. He was transferred into the custody of the ECCC on 19 September 2007. His trial began on 27 June 2011, and also ended on 7 August 2014, with a life sentence imposed for crimes against humanity. Yang Seri, a former foreign minister, who was indicted on charges of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and several other crimes under Cambodian law on 15 September 2010. He was transferred into the custody of the ECCC on 12 November 2007. His trial started on 27 June 2011, and ended with his death on 14 March 2013. He was never convicted. Yang Tirith, a former Minister for Social Affairs and wife of Yang Seri, who was indicted on charges of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and several other crimes under Cambodian law on 15 September 2010. She was transferred into the custody of the ECCC on 12 November 2007. Proceedings against her have been suspended pending a health evaluation. There has been disagreement between some of the international jurists and the Cambodian government over whether any other people should be tried by the tribunal. By the International Criminal Court Since 2002, the International Criminal Court can exercise its jurisdiction if national courts are unwilling or unable to investigate or prosecute genocide, thus being a court of last resort, leaving the primary responsibility to exercise jurisdiction over alleged criminals to individual states. Due to the United States' concerns over the ICC, the United States prefers to continue to use specially convened international tribunals for such investigations and potential prosecutions. Darfur, Sudan There has been much debate over categorizing the situation in Darfur as genocide. The ongoing conflict in Darfur, Sudan, which started in 2003, was declared a genocide 
by United States Secretary of State Colin Powell on 9 September 2004 in testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Since that time however, no other permanent member of the UN Security Council has done so. In fact, in January 2005, an International Commission of Inquiry on Darfur, authorized by UN Security Council Resolution 1564 of 2004, issued a report to the Secretary General stating that, "...the government of the Sudan has not pursued a policy of genocide." Nevertheless, the Commission cautioned that, the conclusion that no genocidal policy has been pursued and implemented in Darfur by the government authorities, directly or through the militias under their control, should not be taken in any way as detracting from the gravity of the crimes perpetrated in that region. International offenses such as the crimes against humanity and war crimes that have been committed in Darfur may be no less serious and heinous than genocide. In March 2005, the Security Council formally referred the situation in Darfur to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, taking into account the Commission report but without mentioning any specific crimes. Two permanent members of the Security Council, the United States and China, abstained from the vote on the referral resolution. As of his fourth report to the Security Council, the prosecutor has found reasonable grounds to believe that the individuals identified in the UN Security Council Resolution 1593 have committed crimes against humanity and war crimes but did not find sufficient evidence to prosecute for genocide in April 2007 the judges of the ICC issued arrest warrants against the former minister of state for the interior Ahmad Harun and a militia Janjaweed leader, Ali Kushabe, for crimes against humanity and war crimes. On 14 July 2008, prosecutors at the International Criminal Court ICC, filed ten charges of war crimes against Sudan's President Omar al Bashir, three counts of genocide, five of crimes against humanity, and two of murder. The ICC's prosecutors claimed that al Bashir masterminded and implemented a plan to destroy in substantial part three tribal groups in Darfur because of their ethnicity. On 4 March 2009, the ICC issued a warrant of arrest for Omar al-Bashir, President of Sudan as the ICC pre-trial chamber I concluded that his position as head of state does not grant him immunity against prosecution before the ICC. The warrant was for war crimes and crimes against humanity. It did not include the crime of genocide because the majority of the chamber did not find that the prosecutors had provided enough evidence to include such a charge. Later the decision was changed by the appeals panel and after issuing the second decision, charges against Omar al-Bashir include three counts of genocide. <laughs> <laughs> genocide in history The concept of genocide can be applied to historical events of the past. The preamble to the CPPCG states that, "...at all periods of history genocide has inflicted great losses on humanity." Revisionist attempts to challenge or affirm claims of genocide are illegal in some countries. For example, several European countries ban the denial of the Holocaust or the Armenian Genocide, while in Turkey referring to the mass killings of Armenians, Greeks, Assyrians and Maronites as genocides may be prosecuted under Article 301. William Rubinstein argues that the origin of 20th century genocides can be traced back to the collapse of the elite structure and normal modes of government in parts of Europe following the First World War. The age of totalitarianism included nearly all of the infamous examples of genocide in modern history, headed by the Jewish Holocaust, but also comprising the mass murders and purges of the communist world, other mass killings carried out by Nazi Germany and its allies, and also the Armenian Genocide of 1915. All these slaughters, it is argued here, had a common origin, the collapse of the elite structure and normal modes of government of much of Central, Eastern and Southern Europe as a result of the First World War, without which surely neither communism nor fascism would have existed except in the minds of unknown agitators and crackpots. <laughs> Stages of genocide, influences leading to genocide, and efforts to prevent it For genocide to happen, there must be certain preconditions. Foremost among them is a national culture that does not place a high value on human life. 
A totalitarian society, with its assumed superior ideology, is also a precondition for genocidal acts. In addition, members of the dominant society must perceive their potential victims as less than fully human, as pagans, savages, uncouth barbarians, unbelievers, effete degenerates, ritual outlaws, racial inferiors, class antagonists, counter-revolutionaries, and so on. In themselves, these conditions are not enough for the perpetrators to commit genocide. To do that, that is, to commit genocide, the perpetrators need a strong, centralized authority and bureaucratic organization as well as pathological individuals and criminals. Also required is a campaign of vilification and dehumanization of the victims by the perpetrators, who are usually new states or new regimes attempting to impose conformity to a new ideology and its model of society. In 1996 Gregory Stanton, the president of Genocide Watch, presented a briefing paper called the Eight Stages of Genocide", at the United States Department of State. In it he suggested that genocide develops in eight stages that are "...predictable but not inexorable." The Stanton paper was presented to the State Department, shortly after the Rwandan genocide and much of its analysis is based on why that genocide occurred. The preventative measures suggested, given the briefing paper's original target audience, were those that the United States could implement directly or indirectly by using its influence on other governments. In April 2012, it was reported that Stanton would soon be officially adding two new stages, discrimination and persecution, to his original theory, which would make for a ten-stage theory of genocide. In a paper for the Social Science Research Council Dirk Moses criticizes the Stanton approach concluding, in view of this rather poor record of ending genocide, the question needs to be asked why the genocide studies paradigm cannot predict and prevent genocides with any accuracy and reliability. The paradigm of genocide studies, as currently constituted in North America in particular, has both strengths and limitations. While the moral fervor and public activism is admirable and salutary, the paradigm appears blind to its own implication in imperial projects that are themselves as much part of the problem as they are part of the solution. The U.S. government called Darfur a genocide to appease domestic lobbies, and because the statement cost it nothing. Darfur will end when it suits the great powers that have a stake in the region. Other authors have focused on the structural conditions leading up to genocide and the psychological and social processes that create an evolution toward genocide. Irvin Staub showed that economic deterioration and political confusion and disorganization were starting points of increasing discrimination and violence in many instances of genocides and mass killing. They lead to scapegoating a group and ideologies that identified that group as an enemy. A history of devaluation of the group that becomes the victim, past violence against the group that becomes the perpetrator leading to psychological wounds, authoritarian cultures and political systems, and the passivity of internal and external witnesses bystanders all contribute to the probability that the violence develops into genocide. Intense conflict between groups that is unresolved, becomes intractable and violent can also lead to genocide. The conditions that lead to genocide provide guidance to early prevention, such as humanizing a devalued group, creating ideologies that embrace all groups, and activating bystander responses. There is substantial research to indicate how this can be done, but information is only slowly transformed into action. Kel Anderson uses a dichotomistic classification of genocides, hot genocides, motivated by hate and the victim's threatening nature, with low intensity cold genocides, rooted in victims' supposed inferiority. See also equals equals notes. <laughs>